right, so let's get started. Thanks for joining. Today in the OTT, we're doing some practice uh, questions for the AWS Developer Associate exam. And yeah, let's see uh, if we can make progress. And as we go, we can finish the test early for time, and then we can review. We're not expected to know everything, but we can try to learn after reviewing the results and hopefully also take some notes that, that usually helps. So I started here uh, the exam that is from the Udemy course of, oh, uh, it's the course that I took for the Arctic Associate. So I'm doing the same steps now for the developer. And let's get started. Let me know if you want me to scroll down. There's two more options below. Yes, can you scroll down a little bit just to see the other ones? So this will be a policy from IAM, no? Let's see. It's either a resource policy or a YAM policy. Yeah, I guess it's a YAM policy. Seems to be an IAM policy. So this one is for get object. So it's not yeah. put. So we can discard it. Okay. This false. <laughs> Seems <laughs> weird because I can exclude this one. We got yeah, either it's, it's... KMS or this one. What's the difference? Yeah. One is denied. That one is denied. Deny an encrypted object uploads. Oh, and the one that had the false, it's also denied. It's the not, is, not... <laughs> the difference is in the condition. The, the third one says string non equals, and the first one says string equals. Oh, oh so the first one. Uh, I think it's a third one. String not equals. I'm not sure. So yeah, yeah, string not equal. Yeah, no, I think it's the first one. A string not equals. We want to deny the put object if the string not equals this header uh, to encrypt the KMS. Yeah, mm, makes sense. That's, I think it's the first. That's right. Then let's do I think five or six, and then we check the sure. the answer. Oh man, a lot of cloud front. Oh, cloud front. We can discard the second one, no? For sure. <laughs> we can it has to be encrypted. Yeah, <laughs> there's always one you can discard. So it's either between cloud front and backend, or between clients and cloud front, or both. I will say the first one, can we discard that one too? Because it's saying that encryption is going. So we only between CloudFront and the backend. So the connection mm -hmm. between the client and the and CloudFront will be in plain. Yeah, we can discard it. I would say it's the third one, but I'm not sure. I th think it's the fourth one. I'm not sure. <laughs> I think it's the third one. Yeah. Okay. I'm not sure <laughs> either, but I mean what I'm assuming is that when the the connection gets to CloudFront, getting from CloudFront to the backend should be inside AWS. So no need of encryption there, but not sure. Maybe you need it also. I also think it's the third. Uh, usually when the exam is asking you about security and encryption, AWS is encrypting everything. So <laughs> okay. it's usually safe to assume that you, you can encrypt it. But uh, a hint, and this is also the type of question that you see in the developer, but not in the architect. Mm -hmm. Here they're asking you about the details of the CLI. Okay. I think this doesn't exist. I don't think encryption is a thing. I think this is also silly. I'm not gonna hook a lambda for that. I don't know. I don't know. The, this this is related to call build cap. It says artifacts to be automatically encrypted. So that's the key. I will risk the fourth one, but not sure <laughs> if it was a feature from call build. Number four. Because this one is in flight, but I don't see the question specifying that they they want in flight or at rest. Mm, yeah, we can risk. <laughs> yeah, I think we're going to take a risk, but it makes sense. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's an easy one. Yeah. Second one. Yeah. yeah, like user data has nothing to do with permissions, configures, but call formation. It's not mentioned, so the role is what's going to give it uh, the EC2 permission. Easy one. Mm. I would say number two, but I would prefer the number three. I think it's number three. Yes. 
I don't know, maybe it's a hard limit, but I don't think so. If you have the issue, you, you, you can fix it with number two. Uh, if you need more throttle, mm. more throttle output, uh, then you, you need to number three. The key is to cost effectively send. If you need to fix it with code, it's the second one. <laughs> it makes sense. That's right. I would say exponential back off. Yeah. This one is tricky because both are valid ways. Kind of. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, unless they are trying to say you you are you are doing a wrong usage of SES. Maybe that, that's the message. Yeah, could be. Like maybe you cannot uh, request a ticket to in increase the throughput. Maybe you are actually hitting the limit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Hard limits and soft limits. Let's do one more. Okay. I think it's the first one. Yeah, I think it's the same. I work with the Elastic Beanstalk and I think it has some vitamins, but not completely yeah. sure. So it has, yeah. I'm not sure if you can deploy different versions on each environment, but I'm assuming yes, because y yes, you can. Vitamins, why? Okay, sounds good. Let's finish and see how it is. Oh, this one yeah. is also interesting. You want to do Let's this one or? Do one more. Yeah. Awesome. I think we're very familiar with this. They want to use a high-level programming language to model the infrastructure. So it has to be CDK. Sure. Oh, it says using the programming languages. That's the key. Okay, yeah. It's, we should get seven. Oh. We got seven right. Oh, that's awesome. We got everything right? Oh, nice. The first Maybe one. Nice this one, I love these ones because you can do by logic. You don't need to remember things. Yeah. Uh, let's see, we weren't sure about this one. So you can configure. Oh, there, there are two configurations. A viewer protocol policy here, and then origin protocol policy. You can match the viewer or HTTPS only. Right. Uh, okay, so it was a feature. <laughs> yes, yeah, so KMS makes it easy to create and manage keys for code build to encrypt and uh, its build output artifacts. It needs access to KMS. By default, they use an AWS managed CM key for S3 in your account. So there's this environment variable, the identifier of the KMS key is using, then you specify the key. I'm not so sure how then the thing is deployed, but like it's encrypted and then how it's decrypted to deploy, I don't know. I think there's a the code deploy, which is a different yeah. service. And, and just you pass the key and it works. <laughs> Hook is for integration is not relevant. This SDK makes it easier for you to implement encryption in your application. Mm. So it exists. <laughs> Just think SSL. Yeah, it's not related. It's oh, an that easy was... one. Just a rule. Oh, nice. Spawning show back off. So let's see why that is retriable, is different. Then other errors, a request rejected with throttling error can be retried at a later time and will likely succeed. Retries are selfish. In other words, when a client retries, it spends more of the server's time to get a higher chance of success. Failures are caused by overload retries. That increased load can make matters worse. They can even delay recovery by keeping the load high long after the original issue is resolved. The preferred solution is to use a backup. Instead of retrying immediately and aggressively, the client waits some amount of time between tries. So the exponential backup. A variety of factors can affect your send rate, message size, network performance, or SES availability. The advantage of the exponential backup is that your application will self-tune it and call SES at close to the maximum rate allowed. And why is not the race if the ticket, if throttling errors is persistent, then it indicates high load of the system. Increasing the throttle limit will be the right solution for if it's persistence. And the question is, it said that it was in, intermittent. Oh, well, I didn't. Yeah. Brother. Yeah, I saw that. It was tricky. Yeah, yeah the, the confusing part here is that it's, it's a solution applied from the client side rather than on the services side. So that's why it's misleading or it can be tricky, at least for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yes. It's not an automatic thing that is sending messages. 
And also that the exponential back cough should be in place and no matter the rate, no matter if you are sending few or a lot of messages, you should be have this in place. And after this is in place, then you can start raising the limit. Yeah, and something important about the CS is that you have to take care of bounces. And bounces are a whole are a part thing because you can have bounces as, as it mentions there because of transient transient problems. Like for example, it tried to send the email, but the web server of the email rejected. And maybe it's not because the email doesn't exist, but it was a transient. So I, I implemented once a uh, um algorithm and with exponential back off also. If it was transient, we keep trying with exponential back off until we get the email sent. And the risk is that you can block your account right from you sending emails. You should reduce also the bounces number. If it's more than 14%, then they will start sending emails to you. Hey, there's something wrong there. And we got this one right. Thank you, Lorenzo. He was sure about this one. No, but, ah, yeah. It's the environment. Yeah, yeah, the environment thing, yeah. The beanstalk. It's a common practice to have many environments. You can apply multiple, so you can have dev and load tests. It's pretty cool. So I have a question about that or a comment. Mostly what, I, what I've mostly seen in infrastructures is you just create separate accounts for each environment. Is this what Elastic Beanstalk will be doing or is it create, creating several environments within one account? No, it's in the same account. In fact, the last thing is kind of an old service, but they, they are, I don't know why they are still <laughs> promoting it. Maybe because it's easy to use and there is a lot of people already using it. But it has some nice features like this one. As, as you mentioned, Einstein, you cannot do multi-account in this case. You are like inside the service already and you use the features there. Thank you. In any case, multi-account is <laughs> the recommendation now, <laughs> always. Yeah, it's really good. It helps you see the cost per workload, for example. So you can have an account for a specific type of load, then you can see how much it costs. And it doesn't get tricky to, like, why is my bill so high? And you have no idea because it's everything in the same account. Yeah. And also, you ensure you don't change data in production. Yeah. No one can. All right. And this one, it was simple. It's just CDK. Do we have time to, to continue? Well, I think we use uh, the OTT time. I can stay long. I don't, this is beneficial yeah. to me. For one more pass. You want to do one more? Yeah. yeah let's do so. If, you, if anyone else has questions, we can also start doing some Q&A. Just let me know. We can test. Otherwise, let's just use the time to continue the test. All good. Makes sense, right? Yeah, conditions is a way to put conditions in cloud formation. You cannot do if a string equals something. You should define that on conditions. And then you use those conditions in your resources. Or you can do conditions on conditions. And you can do different parameters depending on conditions. But the outputs are just plain outputs. Yeah. Well, why would you make a conditional output? It's pretty... Exactly. Yeah. I mean, and this is what I think. I, can be wrong. Yeah, I'm not 100% either, but you, it, you can do conditions much. on parameters because parameter is something that you, uh, you type or, uh, when the stack is being created, uh, when you imported the template, right? It's a good question hmm. because um, I, I have used mappings. Yes. And I choose a different map by a parameter are making me think maybe it's parameters it could be and you could do conditions no. in outputs. yeah I i'm not sure that's outputs make sense too yeah yeah no but it's it's true what you're saying because parameters are a way to inject parameters yeah from the execution of the template so yeah, it's... change them yeah it's an input that's also true i'm not convinced with parameters but... do you want to ask uh, chat gpt i don't trust chat gpt I think we Let can choose see. one and, and see. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go with output. Okay. We will okay. learn the truth in any case. Yes. Can we discard the classic? I'm not sure. I think with, so. ECS, with ECS or Beanstalk? I think that the key yeah. to choose ECS is 
where it says Dockerize and stored in a registry service. I think if you use Elastic Binter with Docker, you don't use a registry, but not completely sure. It's my guess. Because, no? Can Elastic Beanstalk work with containers? Uh, I don't know if it's container, but it, you can run Docker. That's something I, I learned two, three days ago. But you can run Docker. But I don't think you have a registry. I don't know the difference between that classic load balancer application load balancer. I think the application load balancer is newer. Yeah. More capabilities. I, I know the application load balancer is layer seven. Classic load balancer, I'm not sure. I know the network load balancer is layer four. So I'm not sure about the, the classic load balancer. That's the one I'm confused about. And one thing is, I'm seeing there is on the same EC2 instance. When we are talking of ECS. Oh, yeah. Or it's not easy to. Okay, uh, that's that's true. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. With ECS, I know that you can use either Fargate for it to be serverless, or or, or you can specify an EC2 and put the containers there. Yep. Yeah. And I don't know if you can use classic load balancer with ECS. But he's I running think... a single, a single EC2 instance. It seems like because all services should run on the same EC2 instance. So it's speak, speaking of a single instance. Mm -hmm. So I think that would that would be a classic load balancer. But if you're running a single instance, why would you need ECS? Or the uh, Dockerized part. Yeah, that's why I was asking if Beanstalk runs Dockerized stuff. I, yes. I guess I would go with classic load balancer plus ECS if I had to guess. But uh, it says that you should support dynamic port mapping. And oh, yeah. That's, I know, I know. As I don't know the details of the classic. Well, we'll know. Yeah. They are not uh, deprecating. Your best guess, and then we'll see the explanation, because I'm not okay. sure. Yeah, I think the classic is deprecated. Yeah, I never okay. saw a case where it was the choice. Yeah. I think I would go with the third one. Yeah, yeah. let's try it. The explanation for this one will be very good to learn. I would say the first one, definitely. Is a possibility. I would say the first and second one. The like two. Yeah. The conditions for who are. Maybe the third one. I'm not sure. I, I would still stick to the. Yeah, the, the, third two, the number two doesn't make sense for me because if this uh, was disabled by default, there would be no traffic. But it says uh, but here. That is true. Yeah, but it's saying that it, it has more traffic. So. Yeah. This is, is in a way it's enabled. That's true. Hmm. Yeah, the ELB part, like it's not specifying whether it's a application load balancer or a network load balancer. Okay. So okay. it's the higher level term. So if it was specifying that it is a network, we could think about TCP. But okay, so I don't know if we can. Yeah. Yeah. The only one that is not ELB is the classic. I think they all fall under the same umbrella name. They're all ELBs. Maybe I'm wrong, but... Uh, How about like, the third uh, one? The third one, you could have capacity in one, certain capacity in another, and the load balancer, once once the one, one reaches capacity, would start using another instance. I'm not sure on that one because I know that there could be different instance types on different regions. But I'm assuming that if you have something available in one region, it's available in all the ACs. But not sure. It's something I'm assuming. After you disable an AZ, this is silly. I don't yeah. think you can disable an AZ. Like for ALBs, cross zone, cross zone is disabled by default. That could be true. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now I'm rethinking because it's talking about ALBs. So if it says that it's disabled by default, it could be true, but it doesn't relate to the context of the question. So I guess I, I'll still. It is more to another. Okay. Yeah, because it's like why this issue is happening. This could be true, but it doesn't have anything to do with why this issue is happening. Yeah, there's partial traffic. It doesn't mean there's no zero traffic. This one makes sense. If the capacity is different, the ALB could be trying to put more requests to the to the biggest machine. It could be true. And this, there could be short-lived TCP between. This could only happen in the network load balancer. 
but if it's the case, it could be the reason why there's more traffic to one than the other, just because like the short lived TCP connections could be happening at a higher frequency and then the sticky connections make it, I don't know, have a high load. So I guess we, we, just, we can just guess one and three. I don't see. I like one and five, but like let's, let's try three. Yeah, let, let's try it. it. It could be unclear about the type of load balancer. Okay, uh, we saw this, right? So yeah, this let's skip another one of those. What does AWS encrypt? Everything, just one thing, just the other thing. <laughs> Everything supports everything. And yeah. between everything and the second one, <laughs> let's try everything. Let's go. They're not gonna. Way. Amazon will never say that it doesn't support something. It would rather just not put it on the test. It's yeah. my logic, anyways. If I had a company, I don't know. They want to promote that they are very secure, and you can use at your company. Yeah. Like this is the second. Yeah, one and three. No, it's one. Why? Right. I like the second one, but not not sure. I would. I know how Global Accelerator works. The Global Accelerator is very interesting. It provides you a fixed IP and you can use that, for example, to speed up um, TCP reach globally. So if you have like a game with lots and lots of uh, connections in, so what you can do is you can have a regional NLB and put the Global Accelerator in front so that people can reach your network load balancer faster using the AWS uh, internal connection, which is faster than the public internet. So it routes faster and it has huge scale. Uh, I would say it's three in my case, if I had to take an answer. Edge. I don't know if this is really Why performatic. Not Sorry, yeah. I, I went to... Go outside for a minute. Maybe you already discussed this. No, no. We're discussing still. Uh, I was saying that uh, I think you get a performance hit by using Lambda at Edge to fetch from S3 because you can do any computing here that you probably don't need. So if the goal is just to expose the files, yeah. uh, CloudFront should do it. And yeah. So let's go with two. Or what do you think? Yeah, we'll find out soon enough. All right. Still one more. We saw this one in the other, in the architect. Which exam is this? This is the architect, right? That's the developer. Okay. Still interesting. Maybe we can talk about what we know about user data. So it's something, it's some code. It's code, no? Yeah, it's a script. It can be a bash. To boot your application. Yeah, like you can install things in the EC2 as it boots up. So it would make sense for it to be root because you want to install things and it runs only once. So at that time, you have privileges. And the second one. The second one, yeah. Like two. Yeah, that's all right. Uh, we saw this one and it's new. I think that as it's talking about workflow, step functions, should be the key, no? Because okay. none of those are services are workflow oriented. They are just messages. Yeah, yeah. And the step function can be active for up to a year. So mm. it can be there and preserve its state. And you yeah. can see like in which step it is. So I guess it's the best solution for yeah. doing a, a long running process and having visibility. I'm crossed between one, the second and the third one, but the third, but the event bridge itself does not track anything. You would have to set up a, a, you know, your own code to capture the events and, yeah. and change the states. So that would not there, be the best. There's uh, no state. Then you have SNS, which is kind of the same, the same limitations. You need to code stuff. So yeah, to me, definitely the step function, but you still need to code it. Also, the good thing about the step function is that you have state, you can have states and you can go back to other states from, from every step. Yeah. Yeah. Like if the question also talked about sharing the stream across different accounts, then even bridge would be better. Yeah. But it's a single workflow. 
All right. And I know there is an endpoint for this, no? The second one, I guess. Right? You need to query the metadata, not the user data. Query the metadata. How about the third one? Does that exist? Yeah. Well, I don't know. Uh, if you know the IAM role, then it'll help you locate it. But uh... I don't know why the first one and the second one. Oh, one says user data. And user data is the script. Yeah. And I know there is an endpoint. Oh. Yeah. I also think it's the second one because of the word. Yeah. But 254 seems right. Yeah. And the yes. third one is not. It's just creating a role. Let's take a look at the answers. Got seven right. We skipped a couple. Oh. We should have listened to Loi. Let's learn. Parameters enable you to do input. What we were talking about, Lennis. Yeah. You cannot put a condition on something that is an input. Makes sense. Oh, because it's a YAML file? No, no, no. Conditions is a, something you can use. I think it's more because it's an input that you enter. Yeah. Makes sense to have a decision on output, but not on an input. Yeah. I think I have used conditions. Yeah. You know, no. So you, if you created something or not, you can decide the output. Makes sense. Got this one right. Oh, dynamic formatting. The classic load balancer doesn't allow you to run multiple copies of a task on the same instance. So it's pretty much useless. Aesthetic the map, however, the LB uses dynamic mapping. And why not the ALB with the Beanstalk? You can create a Docker environment. That's why I was Ah, okay. Yeah. It, it would have been that one. However, it yeah, but... gives you finer control. The, the one which you chose is better. It's not really, it seems to be correct. <laughs> That's weird. Oh, we got this one right. Nice. Oh, nice. So it was a sticky sessions. In the capacity. And inside type. Nice. Yeah, interesting. That makes sense. Oh, yeah, the sticky this, of course. Me too. I remember this. A sticky sessions are sessions that if you are handled by one container, you keep being handled by that one. Sticky sessions are good for web sockets and stuff. And the second one, it's, it wasn't by the thing I thought it was. It's because if you have different size instance, it will give more requests to the higher. It's best practice to use the same type to reduce the likelihood of gaps and imbalance of traffic. And then why not the TCP? Long live TCP connections between clients potentially lead to unequal distribution of traffic by the load balancer. Long live TCP connections between clients cause uneven traffic. As a result, new instances can take longer to reach equilibrium. Be sure to check. So, well, it could be a reason why it's not correct. No, because the option is uh, short lived yeah. TCP. Oh. It's only what it's trying to say, it's only possible if the connections are long lived, not short lived. Oh, nice. Then we did this one, so we skipped, and this is correct. They encrypt everything again here. Encrypt everything. That was AWS can do it all. Those are three points. Then let's read about the Lambda at Edge. So Lambda at Edge is a general purpose service compute for computer, feature. Not for content delivery. Yeah. It's yeah, and also the Lambda at Edge means you don't have access to your resources in our services. You just can access those services that live on the edge. So for example, if you get a file from an S3 bucket, you are on the edge, but you are going all the way through the original server. So it, it loses all the purpose. It's a limited service. I guess a simple way to put it is Lambda Edge for this for computing, and then the cloud front can do, can do the rest if it's content delivery. And Is that a good for that's a good analogy, and even for dynamic and also uh, static and dynamic content. Oh yeah, which is interesting. So Lambda Edge is for comp from distributed, com I guess, edge computing. Yeah, land the name says it all. And then the global accelerator is a different use case as well. So it can increase the performance by a lot. It provides you two global static IPs as entry point. You can connect it to an ALB, NLB, EC2, and even Elastic IPs. Accelerator reroutes the traffic, the traffic 
through the nearest healthy available endpoint to mediate failure. So you can also use this to a uh, regional failover, which is pretty cool. Cloud Phone improves performance for both cacheable content, such as image, and dynamic content, such as API, uh, and dynamic site delivery. Global Accelerator is a good fit for non-HTTP use cases, such as gaming, UDP, IoT, MQTT, or voice over IP, as well as for HTTP that uh, specifically requires static IP or deterministic fast regional failover. So in some questions, they're going to ask you that they want to um, uh, whitelist your cloud in their on-premise service. And in that case, you cannot use CloudFront because the IP is like a random CloudFront ID and the global accelerator is going to give you two. So they just whitelist the, the IPs that you give and you can work with on-premise. This is not a confidence booster for the test. Well, I'm glad I'm getting them wrong here and not in the test. That's part <laughs> of the sure. process. This one, we kind of knew. It's kind of easy. We've seen this one before. We skipped yeah, this one because we already saw. We got this right. All the step functions. Yeah. That's visual workflows, fast translation of business requirements into technical requirements, improve resiliency, it manages state. Checkpoints, restarts. Yeah. Built in try cache, retry, rollback, write less code. And then the other alternatives were not a good fit. We got this right. This type of question. So it's both on the developer and also in the architect exam. They ask you about this for whatever reason. Latest metadata. And then here we stopped. All right. We did good. Mostly. Awesome. All right. Hey, man, so thank you for, for doing this. Helpful. <laughs> Fair thing. Well, I stop, stop the recording.